Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our discussion on the freedom of assembly and restoring constitutional protections for civil society. My name is William Hahn. I'm a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and this evening's moderator. I'm honored to be joined this evening by an outstanding collection of scholars and practitioners. I want us to dive right into our discussion on time, so I won't be providing you all the detailed introductions that you all richly deserve, but I think it will become apparent from our speakers' comments this evening that they have all been directly involved in articulating a coherent account of how and why our Constitution protects civil society. Our speakers this evening are Casey Maddox, Americans for Prosperity Foundation's Vice President for Legal and Judicial Strategy, Paul Horowitz, the Gordon Rosen Professor of Law at the University of Alabama, Luke Sheehan, a professor of political science at Duquesne University, and Yuval Levin, Director for Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AEI. The jumping off point for this evening's discussion is the Supreme Court's recent decision in Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta. The question before the court focused on whether the First Amendment protected the right of nonprofit organizations to not disclose their major donors against California's claim that doing so was necessary to improve future law enforcement. The threat to anonymous assembly posed by this case was so astonishing that it engendered over 40 friend to court briefs supporting the challengers, with briefs ranging the political and ideological spectrum. But the case raised deeper questions as well, from the Constitution's current level of protection for assemblies in civil society, to the conditions for that protection, and why such protection is so crucial for human formation and self-government. So I wanted to start tonight with Casey, coming from Americans for Prosperity. Would you be able to kind of start us off with an overview of the case and situating it within the current state of free association jurisprudence and the deeper issues it's raised regarding free assembly and protections for civil society? Thank you, happy to do that, Will, and uh, very pleased to be able to join this uh, impressive panel. Um, so freedom of association or freedom of assembly, as we'll talk uh, more about today, you'll hear those terms uh, to some degree used interchangeably, and I, but I think they, there are important distinctions uh, that we can dive into, is a critical constitutional freedom that I, I don't believe has received the attention and protection that it's due. Um, I believe the court should be working to re-examine its doctrine and that legal advocates um, should be working to expand the protection of this critical freedom. So why is it important? Well, let's look first at some of the other provisions of the First Amendment and why we think uh, that they are important. So free speech, uh, we identify as being important because it's through testing ideas that we discover what the truth is, or we at least come to a fuller understanding uh, of what the truth is. Free exercise is important because we've seen the alternative, the wars of religion that uh, that happen uh, where one religion can actually use the power of the state against a rival, placing the government be between a, a person and, a, and his or her God. And as Thomas Jefferson argued, the free press is critical um, because uh, in a democracy, you need an informed citizenry uh, that, that's necessary uh, to having any kind of a, a of actually functioning self-government. Freedom of assembly is important uh, because it's the very basis for a thriving civil society. It's necessary for having a, uh, uh, and that civil society is necessary for having a robust democracy. In Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations to give entertainments, to found seminaries, to build inns, to construct churches, to diffuse books, to send missionaries to the Antipodes, wherever at the head of some new undertaking, you see the government in France or men of rank in England, in the United States, you will be sure to find an association. And it wasn't just these formal associations with bylaws uh, that de Tocqueville believed uniquely prepared Americans for uh, life in a democracy. He said, if an accident happens on the highway, everybody hastens to help the sufferer. If some great and sudden calamity befalls a family, the purses of a thousand strangers are willingly opened. This voluntary cooperation among Americans advocating or contributing toward common cause set us apart uh, in de Tocqueville's view and made us uniquely active in our self-government. That was the root of what he uh, identified, uh, what we would now understand as being American exceptionalism, 
So I want to tell you the story of how free assembly or free association are going today uh, in two cases. And they happen to be two cases with which I've been personally involved. Um, and they have very different results uh, at the court. So I hope my brief introduction will provide the opportunity for a more robust conversation about these cases, uh, and particularly the, the most recent one, uh, the American for Prosperity decision uh, among the panel. So a decade ago in Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, UC Hastings College of Law had decided that it would de-recognize um, from the university a small group of Christian students at the school because the group drew their elected leaders from those who share the group's religious beliefs. UC Hastings deemed that to be discrimination in violation of the school's non-discrimination policy. Hastings later interpreted that policy to not only prohibit discrimination on certain uh, prohibited bases, but to require that the leadership of every group at the school had to be open to everyone. Te they later testified that this meant that no group could limit leaders to even those who supported the group's mission, uh, the reason it existed in the first place. And even that the Black Law Students Association would have to agree to allow white supremacists to serve as leaders of the group. As deciding who leads association, the association is uh, arguably the most fundamental part of what being uh, the right of association, being able to decide who will speak for the group that's been formed to speak. Uh, as that is, you know, sort of most fundamental, it's noteworthy that Hastings essentially decided uh, that that right could not be exercised uh, on the campus. When the Supreme Court considered the case, it made, uh, in my view, a number of legal and factual errors that required to be overturned uh, at some point. But the biggest doctrinal error was this decision that government demands that one sacrifice the First Amendment right of association were subsumed by the free speech claim where forum access was involved. So in effect, the court concluded the government could require complete waiver of the right of free association and arguably of any other constitutional right in order to enter a speech forum. Or in other words, you could be forced to choose between free speech or free association. It's, in my view, an abominable decision and one whose error is only lessened by the fact that it's, the Supreme Court seems to know it too. Uh, and so it uh, seems to studiously avoid mentioning or citing or having anything to do with the CLSV Martinez decision, even where logically one side or the other on the court should be pointing to the decision, uh, but it continues to, to ignore it. But it does remain an alarming decision for free association or free assembly because it treats it as a secondary right, derivative of free speech and subject to far less scrutiny uh, than, uh, than it would otherwise be due. Fast forward a decade, uh, the, the court uh, just this past summer issued a very different decision for free assembly uh, in Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta. In 2011, uh, California Attorney General Kamala Harris had begun demanding that every 501c3 charity soliciting in the state submit documentation to her office, identifying the names and the addresses of major donors to the charity. This wasn't a California specific rule. This affected charities all over the country. This is essentially for any charity who wanted uh, to, uh, to, uh, to solicit in California, which essentially means, you know, if you have emails that, um, to an email list that include a, a link to donate to the organization and you have people who are receiving those emails in California, you'd have to comply uh, with this rule. California promised it would not disclose uh, these names to the public but they nevertheless, of course, did. Uh, they disclosed hundreds of Schedule Bs with names of people uh, who had contributed to those charities to the public. So some people might be wondering, uh, this is an attorney general demand. It's a C3 organization. It's disclosure supposedly just to the attorney general, but everyone sort of knows better uh, that the information will get out to other people. This sounds a lot like NAACP versus Alabama 60 years before. And yes, it is quite similar. Uh, to what had happened in NAACP v. Alabama, uh, where the Supreme Court had acknowledged a freedom of association for the, for the first time. But demonstrating the uncertainty of the protection uh, that free association or assembly uh, receive in, in the current jurisprudence, despite NAACP v. Alabama, we lost in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, in this case, after winning at trial, the Ninth Circuit had held that government need not narrowly tailor a demand a blanket demand for member and donor lists of associations and took California uh, 
and it's already failed word that it would keep them confidential going forward. So the Supreme Court took the case and reversed. Uh, just four quick uh, takeaways from that decision. Uh, the court, first of all, held that uh, that this was facially invalid. Uh, the importance of that is that we had spent seven years getting to the Supreme Court to protect, uh, went through an entire trial, uh, multiple trials, in fact, because there was another organization, the Thomas More Law Center, also involved, had to go through trial and, and seven years worth of litigation to get to the Supreme Court to protect these rights. If the court had just decided uh, that the organizations before it were protected and no one else, first of all, it would have left everyone else exposed. It also would have meant uh, that those organizations would have would have all had to have borne an incredibly uh, burdensome cost in order to protect uh, their, their freedom of association. It would have chilled that right uh, for people all over the country. The court also held that exacting scrutiny applies. Uh, this is sort of a mid-level mid uh, scrutiny uh, that applied to the uh, freedom of association interest in this case. Uh, it had to be narrowly tailored to the means chosen to advance it. That's very important. That was really kind of the core legal doctrinal question in the case was whether or not uh, the whatever the government has chosen to do, whether it has to be narrowly tailored uh, to the uh, objective that the government says that it is trying to achieve. The alternative would have made a mockery of the government interest test because it would have allowed the government to just identify an, an objectively uh, obvious government interest that uh, the government clearly has, like fraud or national security or, you know, pick your interest. And then the government could just sort of wave its hand uh, after having identified an, an interest that everyone would agree is clearly an important interest uh, it wouldn't have to actually demonstrate that it was actually even serving that interest uh, with the means chosen. Disclosure, the, the third point is that disclosure to the government itself uh, was a chilling effect. And that's not to say there isn't also a, a chill in disclosure to the public uh, from membership and, uh, and, and donor lists of organizations, and potentially even a greater one in many cases. But the First Amendment protects against disclosure of charitable contributions uh, or memberships of an association. Uh, and, and Justice Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, in the opinion, said the risk of a chilling effect on association is enough because First Amendment freedoms need breathing space to survive. And that's the uh, uh, simply having to disclose your name to uh, to the attorney general, the name list of names to the attorney general. And then the fourth point uh, is that the chilling effect here um, really affected a diverse group of organizations. Will, you mentioned that at the beginning uh, of the panel, uh, the breadth of the organizations that supported us in this case. The court said the gravity of the privacy concerns in this context is further underscored by the filings of hundreds of organizations as amici curiae in support of the petitioners. Far from, far from representing uniquely sensitive causes, these organizations span the ideological spectrum and indeed the full range of human endeavors, from the American Civil Liberties Union to the Proposition 8 Legal Defense Fund, from the Council on American Islamic Relations to the Zionist Organization of America, from Feeding America Eastern Wisconsin to PBS Reno. Uh, the deterrent effect feared by these organizations is real and pervasive, even if their concerns are not shared by every single charity operating or raising funds in California. We ultimately, as you mentioned, had 40 briefs filed in this case from 300 organizations, and they uh, included the NAACP, the Human Rights Campaign, the Southern Poverty Law Center, PETA, Doctors Without Borders, Universities Ballets, pro-life and pro-choice groups, sorority sisters and nuns. Um, and I, my argument has been, and I haven't had anybody contradict me, I think this was the most diverse group of uh, of amici we've say, seen at the Supreme Court in a constitutional case ever. I can't think of, of a case with a more diverse uh, set of amici. So where does this leave us and free association or assembly uh, after this decision? After AFPF v. Bonta, I think free association or assembly is on better footing uh, than it was before. Uh, the court reaffirmed the right and required government not just to identify uh, a substantial interest, but to actually tailor the infringement to that interest. And it also affirmed that disclosure of one's associations to the government itself uh, can, can chill the exercise of that right, and thus threaten the free association that's necessary to build a healthy civil society. But the court didn't apply strict scrutiny. 
uh, noteworthily, um, and as it has in the free speech context, for example. And CLSV Martinez, again, continues to stand for the, for the errant proposition that one can be forced to choose between free speech and association. Most importantly, I think the, the questions that are left uh, after this, what exactly is this right? I've now said several times, free association or assembly. Uh, what exactly is this right that we are talking about? Is it derivative of the free speech clause requiring an expressive purpose for the organization to have any sort of real protection? And if so, what if so many of those community and civic organizations, even some of the ones that I just mentioned um, that supported us in this case, um, and the ones that de Tocqueville believed that were so critical to being a training ground for this American experiment, what exactly uh, does the free assembly clause protect? If, as I assert, the free association or assembly is fundamental to a civil society, a democracy needs to thrive. And the courts and legal advocates should be working to give this right the full protection that the First Amendment affords. So I look forward to digging into these questions with the other panelists. Thanks a lot, Casey. That was re really interesting. And I mean, Paul, kind of maybe go next to you, kind of help us understand why exactly are do we have this construct in the law of, on the one hand, this kind of free floating right to free association, which is not a phrase that you'll find in the Constitution. But on the same token, we have the freedom of assembly, which is specified in the text of the First Amendment. Uh, but at the same time, as Casey's pointing out, the court seems to be pushing these cases into the free speech clause and free speech doctrine. And at the same time, also kind of conditioning protection for association based upon how expressive and politically in particular expressive the association is what is that what is it one where does that come from but then also two what does that say about how we understand our rights does it suggest a kind of focused on the individual's relationship to the government and maybe missing a vocabulary for something that might happen in between those two spaces what does it say what does it tell us Sure. Uh, and I'm going to, I think, back into it uh, a little bit. Um, uh, but um, let me actually start with, and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, pay tribute to him rather than steal his thunder, I think, a couple of things that uh, Yuval has uh, written uh, in this area. So uh, in his book about institutions, Yuval writes that what's distinct about the current moment as we experience it of actual or perceived social crisis is the weakness of institutions um, and the depletion of interpersonal resources at our disposal. And that's a product, uh, and again, I'm conveying a sense of his argument of competing if complementary forces, um, a right, um, as he puts it, and I'm not sure I would say conservatives there, that maybe speaks in terms of principles rather than institutions, which I think is perhaps a, a first hint at the kinds of uh, themes you've, you've noted, and that approaches institutions, governmental certainly, and sometimes non-governmental as well, with suspicion or uh, maybe even more often indifference, a kind of indifference, and a left, um, and perhaps others as well, and with a marked, I think, generational um, inflection that's drawn to identity politics and hostile to institutions insofar as they put institutional mission first and address identity issues second, or decline to see themselves as general purpose um, organizations. Um, uh, in favor instead of seeing themselves as following particular institutional purposes. Um, and Yuval argues that um, what makes institutions what they are is that they're durable forms of common life and they work not just to serve as a communicative platform on behalf of their members, but uh, as a mold that forms those who participate in it and, and that follows some kind of institutionally suited ethic that makes these institutions trustworthy and and not incidentally makes the people who participate in them 
better or more trustworthy. I guess I'd say at least with respect to that function that they, they serve. And if we think an institution no longer plays that formative role or is acting according to its own ethic, um, or when the institution no longer sees itself in those terms, that's when we start losing trust in those institutions. And although, um, well, uh, there are in fact many institutions in which the public has lost trust substantially. Um, my understanding of the data is nonprofits fare better along those lines, um, but that, that could be a kind of a fragile uh, trust. So law has something to say about this, including the law um, framed by the Bonta decision. And it's an important something, but it's only something. And, and the kind of gap between how we would read Bonta as lawyers um, and what we might want from a freedom of association or assembly or from a civic space um, is indicative of that. One model of understanding the world, and that's one I think that we all adopt at different times, but that is particularly strong in law and in the kind of American, con in one stream of the American constitutional tradition, um, is to think of law as opposed to the individual. The individual operates more or less fragile in a legal landscape. And that's all there is in the landscape, right? There's the state on one side and, and a myriad of individual choices on the other, choices to engage in speech, choices maybe to join or not join groups, choices to engage in the free exercise of religion, but highly individually focused. Um, so we might think of uh, the state versus the individual or law versus personal flourishing. And we think of law as something that, unless the courts address it, um, interferes with that realm of personal flourishing or self-fulfillment or what have you. Um, and it's not um, an illegitimate concern. It's, you know, the classic example is somebody getting up on a soapbox and speaking uh, or these days it might be tweeting or what have you. Uh, but there's not much in that landscape. Um, and insofar on that picture as it cares about groups, it's because it tends to think of them as loudspeakers. Their goal is maybe a little bit of safety, but largely to serve as a kind of an aggregation of votes and also a, a, a megaphone. Um, so the, the group... Uh, is a kind of loudspeaker, and that's why the individual joins it, uh, or a device for achieving efficiencies because you'll be heard more and understood better. Of course, a, a counter vision to all this is, uh, and it is, I think, important to remember that all the institutions that we care about that Casey mentioned or that come up in Yuval's book um, were fundamentally a part of the, the civic landscape. They were there at the same time as the state that we now focus our attention on much of the time. They, um, they were there before it, and they grew up alongside it. If we think about the press, for instance, it does not look like um, today. Actually, I would say the bell curve is kind of moving in that direction, but um, certainly the pr professional press, as we thought of it 40 or 50 years ago, did not look like the press during the founding era. But that institution... Um, uh, grew as the state itself grew. And they're every bit as much a part of the framework of our social uh, institutions as more uh, so-called official government institutions. Um, they follow their own logic often. If we think about the, the ethos that they follow, um, they don't necessarily operate in terms of the kinds of requirements of voting or due process or membership that we might want to impose on public institutions. Um, we, we want professionalism in the professions or accuracy 
in the academy or the search for truth to be the ethic that they follow as opposed to and i think this was i would say was to some degree although it's always there and in some areas is still prevalent as opposed to insisting on following what nancy rosenblum calls a logic of congruence where once we have an image of what the state as a democratic institution should do we then apply that to every other body um, and measure it against that standard um, in some ways and again this I, I hope comes to your question the courts and the first amendment recognize this but they do so clumsily um, and I think it's right. I think the word you used is right. They lack the vocabulary to speak directly in those terms. And we might, um, even as we criticize and worry about it, spare some sympathy for them. We want courts to come up with generally available rules. We want them not to um, operate too dangerously outside of their skill set. Um, and we want some degree of predictability. And so what the courts come up with, in, in large measure because they're also influenced by the time period in which a lot of this jurisprudence of the First Amendment develops, is doctrine that can be applied across the board. Um, and a lot of that, um, because institutions are so varied, I think ends up getting assimilated to expression. Um, so as I say, it's not all a bad thing, um, but it does leave a remainder, a gap. Uh, and the law could do more to recognize institutions as such. At a minimum, it can reject this idea that they all need to follow a logic of congruence and appreciate that they serve different functions. Um, it can, and often it's what a more institutional approach would amount to. It can fill in the context more richly uh, when looking at these kinds of cases. Um, and often, as it does, at least sometimes, defer to these groups' sense of their own purposes. So to take a couple examples, one particularly strong, um, when the Boy Scouts made decisions about who to have in their membership. Uh, and when a St. Patrick's Day parade made exclusions of members, the court said, we're gonna look first and foremost to their sense of what it is they do and what they want to do. And I should add that that conversation continued even after the court got out of the way. It was legitimate for those groups to say, we have changed our mind about membership, about who ought to be a member, right? And people can have those internecine debates, but the court gave them some space. And the other profound example is the ministerial exception. If there's anywhere where the court has been most responsive to these kinds of institutional concerns and the limits of its knowledge, it's been in, in the court area where it said, we have no business trying to figure out who the leader of a religious group should be or who, in its wisdom, it should exclude from leadership positions. That's not an endorsement of all those decisions, uh, but it's a way of saying that's outside our jurisdiction. They really, in a sense, have their own jurisdictional space. I think we can think of Bonta in, in well, one more thing I should say, uh, which is, um, and I think this is crucial for people who care about institutions and civil society, um, that is, these decisions, when the court gets them right, leave a good deal of autonomy in the hands of these institutions, but they also leave profound obligations in the hands of the institutions um, to, to act in a way that respects their own ethos, to act in a way that enhances public trust as well as internal trust, and to recognize that institutions are subject to ongoing dialogue. Their public criticism of these institutions from non-members is legitimate and part of the process, and so is internal development. So putting Bonta into this space, we might say a couple things. At least implicitly, maybe not completely directly, but with a fair amount of a sense of it being present in the case. Bonta recognizes uh, 
the frailty of institutions and associations in an environment in which institutions are not much recognized and respected as institutions as such, either by the state or by the public. One way we can think about the kind of pressures on groups in a case like Bonta is we'll push the groups around by pushing the members around. Um, and to the extent that people are focused um, almost obsessively on substantive issues and not on the range of groups that might argue about those issues, um, they, they are impelled to do this without any sense that the institutions themselves matter. Second, um, by emphasizing that exacting scrutiny has teeth, as the court said, uh, and using them, the court carves out a legal space that counteracts that tendency. And this, I think, is how the court often acts rather than say institutions are valuable, assembly or association is valuable. It comes up with a prophylactic rule that it, it can apply generally, a standard of review that leaves that space open for institutional freedom. It doesn't say directly that, the, that transparency is unimportant. I don't think it believes that. It doesn't say quite directly that it distrusts the state to act properly as a state. But it, there is a distinct realist view here that it wants to protect associations against um, the fragmentation or the cutting out from the group that forcing disclosure would permit through leveraging private pressure, especially in this particular age. And, and then one last point, what it doesn't do is address institutional trust. Maybe it can't, maybe uh, the courts are, maybe that's just too far out of their bailiwick. But for us, if we're interested in how law serves association, but also in association itself, it, it matters in terms of, it does not give us any kind of internal ethic. Um, and it does not address or arrest institutional trust. It may be that I'm unique in that I often judge the trustworthiness of a group according to how often I get fundraising letters from it or how much I feel that those fundraising letters or emails are um, intent on arguing that we are simultaneously on the brink of a great victory and a catastrophic defeat um, to kind of like a, um, uh, like a cliffhanger in a TV episode, right? To keep us always on tenterhooks. Um, or <laughs> thinking of other interest groups, I may worry about um, if I don't know who the large stakeholders are and have some sense that there is a goal here that I'm not aware of. Um, it can't answer those questions, um, but for people who care about civil society, even if we think that forcing disclosure is wrong, we can still ask, what's the ethic of anonymity or disclosure that individual groups might care about to establish and then maintain trust? Well, thank you for that, Paul. That was a really helpful overview of the case. And Luke, you know, one thing Paul mentioned was that there's a way Lawyers would read Bonta and what we as citizens, people engaged in the process, might want out of a free assembly, free association, jurisprudence that protects civil society as seeing it essential to self-government and what the Constitution guarantees. And the Constitution, and when the, the court speaks about the Constitution, a cultural lesson is taught. And we see that with free speech where the court's kind of absolutist rhetoric toward free speech over the past 60 or so years has certainly informed cultural perceptions about what the freedom of speech is, the court's competencies in those areas, fears of government balancing or making more context-based determinations of speech. And perhaps those kinds of considerations are also informing the court's reluctance maybe to close that gap in the free assembly context between what we might want out of a free association or free assembly jurisprudence uh, versus the more kind of technical ways in which it's discussed. So what do you think? Do Can courts, is that a gap courts can close? If so, how can they do that? Yeah, thank you, Will. 
<clears throat> I think this is a really important question. So uh, as Paul pointed out, uh, the uh, the court's left a bit of a gap uh, regarding the assembly clause. So the court's done a very good job of unpacking the free speech clause. We have decades of jurisprudence. Uh, as a professor teaching a constitutional law class, I spend weeks talking to students about what the Supreme Court has done in its uh, speech jurisprudence. And of course, I'm just barely scratching the surface, frankly. Um, and then I spend uh, less than one day talking about the assembly clause, teaching two cases, the last one from 1945, um, because the court has ignored to a great degree that clause. Now, there's lots of reasons it's done this. Very complicated jurisprudential history uh, there. Um, but the, the core matter, I, as I see it, is that the reason the free speech clause gets so much attention, and I like much of the attention it got, I can quibble around the edges, but I like it, um, is that the court has a, a view of the First Amendment and what it's doing, and Paul touched on this, as what I call the First Amendment dichotomy. So it sees the First Amendment as negotiating our democratic society. So we have individuals, uh, of course, individual citizens, we express our views. Um, under the protection of the speech clause, and the court allows us to do so so we can engage in democratic government. And this is a big theme in a lot of the uh, scholars and thinkers who have talked about the First Amendment, particularly freedom of speech. Now, what that leaves out is, uh, as Paul has pointed out, is the way in which we, we generally don't actually exercise our First Amendment rights as individuals. Um, almost every time we exercise the our right to free speech, it's through our expressive associations, as the court has pointed out. Uh, when we express our, or when we exercise our religious liberty, it's often through our religious institutions, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, and so on. And there's this curious clause in the First Amendment that gets almost no attention, uh, the freedom of assembly clause, the, the right peaceably to assemble. The court's done next to nothing with it. Uh, and the reason I, I think so is because of that First Amendment dichotomy, you just can't see it. And think about, in, in theory at least, not actually in practice, but in theory, you could exercise your First Amendment rights as an individual. You can speak on your own. You can read your religious scripture and, and pray on your own. You can't assemble by yourself, and you're just some person. Assembling is inherently relational, as John Anazu has pointed out. And the court doesn't have a very good category um, an understanding standards in which it can understand what that exactly will mean, what it protects, what it doesn't protect. And instead, the court has treated it, uh, freedom of, of association as freedom of expressive association. Well, if you're associating with others so that you can express your views and participate in our democratic government, well, that's under the speech clause and it treats it that way. And there's good reasons to do that. Problem is, uh, what about non-expressive associations? What do we do with those? And I think the court needs to investigate this. The clause of the First Amendment demands it. And I think for the sake of civil society, we need to recognize that our civil society associations actually have First Amendment status, even beyond the speech clause, even beyond the free exercise clause. And there's some concepts I think the court could pick up and investigate that would be helpful. The first one is functional autonomy. So right now, when the court examines freedom of association. It examines only the function of expression. So if your group is expressive, it says, well, you can be autonomous uh, to, uh, uh, to your function of the group insofar as that expression matters, insofar as you can express adequately your group. So it gives uh, a group some leeway in who it chooses to permit, as, as the Boy Scouts case uh, indicates. Uh, but this understanding of expressive association is remarkably narrow, as, as Casey pointed out uh, in, in Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. Uh, the court uh, rules that it doesn't protect uh, the ability of a religious group to exclude non-religious individuals. Um, the idea of functional autonomy would expand the court's understanding of what associational rights should be um, to non-expressive groups. Now, there's all sorts of ways in which these standards need to be developed, exceptions made. And this is what the court's done with the speech clause. Over decades, it articulated exceptions to freedom of speech. You can't actually threaten somebody. You can't incite to violence. Uh, it has various standards um, to explain to us what free speech means, what our constitutional rights are, and where, where the boundaries are. And the court needs to do the exact same thing with the assembly clause. And I think functional autonomy is a helpful concept there. There's a few other questions the court can ask, um, such as uh, uh, does this policy, whatever it is under consideration, does it inhibit the exercise of the association's rightful authority? 
So what I mean here is, can the association exercise authority over its members and in the way it pursues its goals? So in Bonta, uh, the decision by the group to uh, keep its donors anonymous, uh, who knows best whether or not that's a good idea? Probably the association. They're the ones who deal with the donors. They're the ones who know what their concerns are. And, and one of the major concerns is, is sort of kind of retaliation against donors, but there are others that it could be. Uh, could be uh, a long-standing practice of of, uh, of of giving anonymously, uh, so that God uh, knows and uh, and uh, not man. So it, it's it's uh, not seeking glory for yourself through your donations. There are lots of reasons you could uh, want uh, anonymous donations, uh, and who knows those best? The uh, the concerns of the group and the donors. Well, the group itself, and that's where we should focus. Another question we should we could ask. Um, does the policy inappropriately interfere with the traditions of the group? And by here, I mean practices within the group. So it could be anonymous donors, or things like that. So things from the outside might seem curious or inconsequential. But to the group, to the insiders, it might be very important that they have those practices and that the court should be very, very hesitant to let government officials intervene, even in, if they have uh, what seems to be a good reason. Uh, that is, we need to heighten the scrutiny and the court does a pretty good job in Bonta. I think it could do a little better in recognizing that uh, the government really has a high standard it needs to meet if it's going to intrude upon the functional autonomy of groups. So those are, are some helpful, helpful con uh, concepts that I think the courts could take into consideration. And I think that legislatures could have a role to play here. So the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, passed by Congress and then by a number of state legislatures uh, was an attempt to recognize the full protections of the, of the free exercise clause. And I've drafted sample legislation for a Freedom of Association Protection Act aimed at uh, reviving the freedom of assembly. So asking courts to look at the assembly clause and providing some standards there for heightened scrutiny uh, that would help the courts out in this matter. Well, thank you for that, uh, Luke. And uh, <clears throat> you've all, just to kind of go to you before we have some engagement among the various panelists here, Luke's kind of proposed rethinking, and then some of the discussion we've had about the kind of confusion where the court is suggests that we need a justification for how we think about association, not only for itself, but also in relation to the other guarantees within the First Amendment. They're all grouped together. Presumably, there's a reason for that. Um, and if it's not just expression, if it's not merely a matter of protecting individual political engagement, then what would that kind of justification be? And what are the things that we can do kind of in the public discourse and in the political process, perhaps, uh, to kind of inspire and in, encourage that kind of fresh thinking about First Amendment guarantees in particular and how they work together? Well, thanks, Will. It's a great question, and I'm, uh, you know, it's 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 a little daunting to be last in a group like this, but it's also a bit liberating since I, I don't have to repeat some of what was said by others better than I could say it, um, and I can speak right to your question. I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm I'm a recovering political scientist, and so I might address your question by drawing attention to the question of the purpose of the First Amendment um, in more than just strictly sort of court language, and even in more than just strictly legal terms, when you look at the particular rights that are guaranteed in the First Amendment um, against religious establishment in favor of free exercise and free speech and the press and the right to assemble and petition, you're looking at a set of activities that are protected from the reach of the legislator. And you have to ask yourself, what is this set as a set? What is the underlying good here that's being protected? The answer to that is not obvious. I mean, I think one common answer to that is that what you're looking at there um, is a is about protecting civic engagement uh, in a Republican polity. But that's not quite right. It's certainly not quite right about the first freedom, the freedom of religion, which is protected in two different ways. I think it's not right even more generally. You might think that it's about core individual rights, but as we've already heard, the right to assemble is not an individual right. Um, the right to the freedom of the press is not really an individual right. I don't think that the freedom of religion is even coherent ultimately as purely an individual right. And so, uh, you know, I, I think this is one reason why we've tended to look for a different rubric and have ended up talking about the rubric of the freedom of association for some of these, uh, for some of these rights. And as we've heard, the, the court has divided that into uh, what we might think of as intimate association and, and expressive association.
And it's expressive association, association that we're really talking about here uh, that encompasses most of the circumstances where you might talk about the First uh, Amendment as involving a right of association. But expressive association suggests a very limited concept of what the rights that are grouped under the First Amendment really protect. To say that the freedom of association is fundamentally about a freedom of expression is, I think, to imply that what citizens need in order to be free is a means of expression. Um, and that strikes me as not as, as a highly incomplete understanding of what freedom is and of what citizens need, and ultimately, therefore, of what the Bill of Rights is. Um, and here, I think the logic of some of the of the amicus briefs that you uh, that you could see in 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 the case this summer, this spring and summer, uh, really pointed in the right direction. I, I would I would point, for example, to the Beckett Fund brief, which said that the case quote, provides the Supreme Court with an ideal opportunity to reground free association in the assembly clause and recognize, and this is the part that I, that I really underlined for myself, that assemblies do not simply allow individuals to express themselves, rather they form citizens in the virtues that make and sustain self-government. I think that's just right. The freedoms that are protected by the First Amendment guard the kinds of practices and the kinds of institutions that are necessary ultimately to form the sorts of people that our society requires. They're formative, not just expressive freedoms. And that insight ultimately runs pretty deep because it, it actually takes you to the kind of anthropological assumption at the root of a lot of our politics, the assumption that human beings start out in an imperfect form. Uh, you know, maybe that you'd say they're fallen, they're, they're unready to be free and have to be somehow shaped, formed by some set of institutions to be capable of freedom. That's really the work of a lot of our institutions. And it's a need that's particularly felt in a society like ours because liberalism demands an extraordinary degree of responsibility and judgment from people. And yet liberal institutions by themselves don't necessarily produce the people who are capable of those kinds of virtues. So that to produce them, you need some cooperation between liberal and pre-liberal institutions. Certainly political institutions in our free society but also family and community and religion and educational and social and cultural institutions so that the freedoms that are laid out in the First Amendment serve in part at least to protect our institutions and traditions of formation, to enable the development of the capacities that we need to be responsible human beings and citizens. And to describe what they let us do as just expressive I think is to really overlook the assumption that underlies most of those institutions, or at least to reject it in favor of a different, of a shallower view of what they do, the view that people start out ready to be free and all they need is liberation and exposure, right? The opportunity to express themselves. I, I would say it is, it is not much of an exaggeration to say that the dispute between these two views of the nature of the human person, whether we need to be formed or we need an, an opportunity to express ourselves is actually the difference at the bottom of a lot of our cultural debates, a lot of the contemporary culture war. So that it's not a coincidence that in our time when that culture war is particularly intense and divisive, the institutions of moral and civic formation, family and religion and education, the university, the press, the legislature and more, find themselves really mired in controversy and, and their basic character, their basic sources of legitimacy are so often demeaned and undermined in our society. The question of whether the freedom of association protects the capacity for formation or the capacity for expression is therefore a really basic and important question. It's a serious question. And it forces us to consider the goals that underlie the Bill of Rights because our constitution is itself unavoidably formative. As you've said, the, the, the law shapes us. The people certainly shape the constitution, but the constitution also shapes the people. So that the Bill of Rights is not only a function of a set of assumptions about what a free society involves, it's also a means of formation of the kinds of people that a free society needs. And the rights that are often grouped under the rubric of freedom of association are particularly worth considering and understanding in that light. It's an understanding that, that should suggest to us that one crucial underlying purpose of that freedom of association is the, is the freedom of formation. We should think of these rights not only in terms of expressive association, but also in terms of formative association, that this is what they do, this is what they serve. They protect our society's capacity uh, 
to form free people uh, who are, after all, a really a central precondition for a free society. So that even the freedom of speech, let alone the freedom of religion and assembly and petition in the press, needs to be understood in part as a freedom to engage in those activities that enable us to become the kind of people that self-government requires that a free society needs. That broader understanding of the purpose of the freedoms that are guarded by the First Amendment has to inform our sense of what it takes to be really free people and why the liberal society requires more than liberalism for its preservation. So that to my mind, the, the issues that are involved in the kinds of cases we're talking about uh, just could not be more important. They reach to the fundamental question of what it takes for our society to sustain itself into another generation. Now, for the courts to formulate a language that allows them to get at this question of formative association, I think would take real work. You want to do that carefully uh, and in a way that's respectful of all of the other values that the courts have been careful to respect and regard. But it's enormously important, I think, ultimately, if we're, if we're going to really understand the freedom of association fully, we have to see that part of what the First Amendment protects is the capacity of our formative institutions to do their work. And we've got to find a vocabulary that lets them function uh, in, in that light. Thank you for that, Yuval. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to open up the queue for questions from the audience. Uh, and while we continue to talk, um, you can submit questions uh, to sophie.rizzeri, R-I-Z-Z, I-E-R-I at AEI.org or on Twitter with hashtag AEI free assembly. Um, but while that's going on, you know, Casey and Paul, you know, you've all mentioned the need for courts to kind of put this broader issue into a language that is accessible and in a way that kind of comports with how we think about legal doctrine and resolving disputes. And of course, the courts have come up with the justifications for this more kind of expressive focused view of association, similar to what we see in free speech, which is a concern about judicial competency to make these kinds of decisions and also concerns about context specific rules, whether that's going to raise the ire of government censorship, even um, we see that certainly in free speech. So, you know, you guys kind of be curious to start off with you two, because Luke had proposed some specific reforms. Like, what do you all think about either those reforms or kind of bringing in this kind of broader anchoring of the First Amendment into our legal doctrine? If you either one, feel free to go first. Well, one of the benefits of thinking about something like functional autonomy is <clears throat> it recognizes, um, assuming you take the functional part of that seriously, um, that there are different functions, different uh, lodestars for different institutions, right? It's um, together in their collectivity that they provide a variety of, I won't say services, but um, activities that enrich our space and that make everything else possible. Uh, and so the functional autonomy of a church may well be different from the functional autonomy of the press or a journalist. Um, and just to, again, strike that note of caution or ambivalence and, and suggest why these are difficult questions, um, the first thing to, even if one is substantially deferential, the first thing to note is it's difficult often to identify who or what belongs in these particular spaces. So um, the debate in journalism over the last 20 to 40 years, but even before that, is who is a journalist? Um, do we have a kind of mid-century professionalized model of who counts as a journalist with all the um, the surrounding um, resources and strictures? Um, or is anybody who has access to a printing press, so to speak, which is now everybody, a journalist? And some of it will depend on the function and the, and the claim involved. Um, a good deal of it will, will depend on that. The other thing to note is some functions um, or some claims will not be suited to that function. Um, some of that is going to be a, um, in the nature of changes in what these institutions do. Um, they're, not they're not absolutely set in stone. 
Um, but if we're thinking, of, if we're worried at all about the limits of some of these rights or of autonomy, part of the answer is um, not every claim you want to make is a claim that properly belongs to you as something fulfilling a particular function. Yeah, you know, I think the um, the thing that came to my mind as I was listening uh, to, to a couple of you speak was uh, the way the court has had to uh, sort of acknowledges this, uh, not intentionally, this this sort of tension uh, in what's missing in the First Amendment uh, in, in its current jurisprudence. And so it it reaches out to find other ways to protect uh, things like, for example, uh, parental rights, right? You have the Supreme Court reaching out to use substantive due process to try to protect parental rights because, you know, I, I think the, the idea of formative association, I, I, I can't think of something that better fits the idea of a formative association or even an intimate association as the court has more recently uh, come to that term. But that that sort of formative nature uh, of the family is is fundamental. You can tell that the court recognized that well, we have to protect this somehow. It must be protected in here in some way, but it reaches outside the First Amendment uh, to find a, a rooting for that. And I think what we're talking about here is uh, ways in which uh, things like that can be uh, you know, really, uh, maybe are better protected uh, through uh, through the First Amendment. I, I think that you know the challenge uh, is, you know, the the court is always going to be concerned about revisiting its doctrine for fear that uh, that requires you to create some some limits on what is protected um, when you are or protecting things that sort of necessarily must be. Uh, how how do we create the boundaries on those things? But uh, but I, I think the idea of functional autonomy, the idea of formative association are uh, very helpful ways to begin to uh, sort of put some sort of framing around this uh, that could give courts and advocates and a, a language to be able to use, to be able to say, um, this is what's protected and this is what might fall outside those protections. Yeah, and and, uh, and Luke, you know, you're, I, I thought it was great of you to, suggest some particular reforms, both legislative and also steps the court could take in terms of doctrine. But two things that kind of came to my mind was one, where do administrative agencies and the regulatory state fit into this? Because interacting, even the whole concept of expressive association kind of makes some presumptions about how law is made in our society and access to the political process that either individuals or institutions would have that don't necessarily hold when you're talking about administrative rulemaking it could be based upon very different premises. And then, of course, I think you also have to think about, I mean, you address this a bit in your book too, the role of just non-discrimination law and how that would affect any kind of understanding of a functional autonomy. What, what would you say to those considerations? Yeah, sure. So uh, sometimes when I, I get uh, some pushback uh, against uh, the concept of functional autonomy, uh, Paul is absolutely right that there are going to be distinctions that have to be made. And I usually say uh, somewhat facetiously, uh, well, let's get some cases before the court and find out. Um, what I mean is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of line drawing that's going to have to take place. And the court precisely does this on the speech clause, and it takes it decades uh, to work these things out because they're really complicated. So what, what are going to be the interactions with uh, administrative agencies? Oh, those are going to be really complex. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's start asking the right questions about uh, functional autonomy or formative association in the context of the assembly clause. And let's start working on this. Uh, so uh, and, and it's, it's really um, astounding just how recently we've actually been thinking about uh, these problems. So uh, uh, some excellent books have come out on the last in the last decade, uh, thinking about First Amendment institutions, that's Paul's book, uh, the freedom of assembly, uh, that's uh, uh, John and Azu's book and my own book uh, coming um, after theirs, and influenced by theirs. Um, but this is all within what, nine years, I think, 
Uh, and then, of course, you have all his books on civil society, but it's actually relatively recent. We started to think, uh, hey, there's this, there's this missing clause, there's this missing understanding of the First Amendment, and there's a lot of thinking that's going to have to go into it. And so the speech clause, um, the court's uh, treatment of it was had decades of books written uh, about freedom of speech and why it was important from a number of, of prominent scholars. And that process is only just beginning for the assembly clause and for First Amendment institutions. There's a lot of thinking that has to go into it. Um, and the and the, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. Second best time is today. Uh, so I really like to uh, to get going on what that's going to look like. Your question about anti-discrimination law raises interesting uh, points and maybe even ironies. Um, and a little bit of an explanation, perhaps, of why the court took a speech-focused view and distinguished between intimate and expressive association with none of the richness of association in between. So the, the irony, um, of course, is that many of the groups that were involved in that were essential to the civil rights struggle in this country were um, thick associations, uh, thick civil society groups of various sorts. And their membership was protected in these key cases. Um, and the result is a movement toward civil rights law, voting rights law, and the protections that are offered, and I think imperfect but real progress in that area. And in the course of doing so, the court had to confront the, not just possibility, but reality, I think, that um, many groups um, formed or altered their sense of what they wanted because they wanted to get out from under any civil rights obligations, um, obligations of equal membership, equal treatment, and so on. And we, the, the, the people, the groups uh, are no longer necessarily in the same position. They don't have the same view. Um, let's obviously recognize those changes. But I think a lot of what the court did in the era where speech and religion most sharply conflicted with equality and civil rights between 65 and 75 um, was um, find ways to finesse those questions, sometimes with per curiam rulings, um, sometimes with something like um, uh, you have intimate association where you can make these choices, even if they're discriminatory choices, because it's the literally the smallest, most intimate unit in which you're engaging in decision making. You have expressive associations um, where uh, you're protecting the ability of, for instance, civil rights groups, but any kind of group to uh, challenge these laws. But there is still some obligation of equal access under civil rights laws. Um, and that's, you know, and I think that's part of what the current conflict is often not judging motives here. It's not always about race. It's about all kinds of conflicts between equality and other liberties. And they are just challenges. And presumably, and this is not an argument against, it's more a recognition of, of the, 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 the challenges faced. Um, that would be part of the discussion with a, a, a more, a richer association or assembly-based view. Uh, how to how to square the circle would would still be an issue. Yeah, we are uh, <clears throat> running a little long on time, but uh, you've all. I'm uh, at the risk of putting you in the the last seat again. I was hoping you wouldn't mind uh, just kind of maybe giving a little bit of a concluding thought about. Just it seems interesting to me, at least, that in this very individualistic age in which we are in culturally and a focus on individuals and lots of suspicion toward institutions and institutional mistrust. At the very same time, we're seeing a lot of cases at the court raising the rights of institutions, the freedom of institutions, how we think about the role of institutions in society and uh, we need to rely on them in certain ways. And so it, it does seem interesting that these those two currents are happening at the same time. And as someone who's observed these kinds of issues closely, I'm just wondering, what you think that might say about the long-term sustainability of this kind of very individualistic focused culture and very individualistic consumer almost approach toward institutions that we're operating under. You know, I think that 
one of the things it suggests is that we are in some important ways really not any longer in a highly individualistic age in our culture. And you can see that in other ways too. We're in, we're in an age now that in a lot of ways is screaming for solidarity. Um, and a lot of that is being processed in ways that I don't think are very healthy. It points toward nationalism for some people. It points toward identity politics for some people. But the underlying desire there is a desire for belonging, a desire for solidarity, for affiliation. It's not the, the individualism that characterized both the rights and the left's approach to uh, these kinds of broad questions, say, two generations ago. And I think in some ways that individualism um, began to exact a price that we have felt as a society. And you see, therefore, in our legislative and executive politics, a swing away from strictly individualist categories. And you're beginning to see the same in our uh, in the courts as well. I think that makes sense. Um, what the courts can do is think through some of these new categories in ways that are at least continuous with our traditions, uh, which are both traditions of individual liberty and traditions of, uh, of communal self-government, and could do us some real favors in terms of making sense of these competing pressures um, in ways that might be more constructive. But I think we shouldn't be surprised that uh, we find now in the courts as well as elsewhere that um, we are moving from an age when left and right fought about who owns the concept of individual liberty to a, a time when left and right are fighting about who owns uh, communal identities and ultimately solidarity. Well, well, thank you very much for that, Yuval. And I don't want to keep our audience or try our audience's patience on a Monday evening, um, but I am uh, extremely grateful for our panelists and this insightful conversation, which I think as all of you alluded to is hopefully the beginning of a much broader discussion and re-anchoring of how we think about the Constitution and its relationship to the space in between the individual and the government. So uh, with that, we are concluded. Thank you all very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.